right. Um, thank you for the introduction and the invitation. And uh, um, yeah, so I'm also very fortunate to have had uh, Felix give the previous talk. Um, so, you know, you only have a 30 minute talk. It's hard to know what to cut. And he gave such a great introduction to neural nets that I um, don't have to go quite as deep to explain things. Okay, so big, bold question. How and why do neural networks work? Obviously, lots of people are working on um, this very question right now. It's a very vague question, um, but it's kind of cool because I think we as mathematicians have a chance to sort of be like the physicist or the biologist where there are these creatures that are doing these things and we get to now use our tool set to find out why the creatures are doing these things. Um, so two little um, ways that I'm gonna be focusing on understanding neural networks, uh, I'm going to have some pictures in the, the next uh, few slides. Um, so these two pictures were shamelessly taken from Wikipedia um, and they, they show um, issues with overfitting, which is something that's way predates uh, artificial neural networks. Um, and so what we have here on the left is we have a set of blue dots and red dots. So we could think of these as measurements of people um, with diabetes, without diabetes, certain measurements of uh, feature um, vectors from images of dogs and cats, just, just things that are in two different categories. Uh, and we would like to figure out a boundary between those categories. Now we could take the data that we know, this trading set, and we could draw this green line separating the blue points and the red points perfectly. Um, and then say we get a new point in and we wanna know whether or not to color it red or blue. Well, if we get a new point that is say right here, so right between, squeeze right between these two blue points, if we'd use this green boundary to separate the points, then we would say, oh, it's on this other side of the green boundary. And so therefore it must be a red point, but it's much closer to these blue points. So that's probably a wrong classification. It's probably not a cat, it's a dog. It's probably not a diabetic person, it's a non-diabetic person. And so one might say that this black boundary is a better boundary. So even though it isn't perfect, it prevents overfitting. Um, and an even more classical example on the right-hand side is we have these points and um, we could fit perfectly a polynomial to these points where there is no mismatch between the function and the points. Um, but obviously this is really complicated and that is probably not a good explanation of the relationship between the two variables. And we might actually choose then to fit a line or something that's fit simpler. So preventing overfitting is something that is really important in, um, in data science in general, not just in neural networks. Um, moving on to something that is more specific to neural networks um, is, is this phenomenon right here. So what happens in nature is when, when we're, we're newly born, we have 50 trillion synapses. Or you can think of these kind of like connections between neurons. Um, and then a one-year-old has the order of like a thousand trillion synapses. And then an adolescent has half as many. Um, now, seeing how college students have been treating uh, the pandemic and pandemic rules, it's easy to make a joke. Well, that's because uh, adolescents and teenagers are not very smart and they're, they're not as smart as a one-year-old. But maybe a more forgiving um, way of looking at this is that the brain has sort of overtrained itself. It's made a ton of connections. And then it says, okay, that was too much. Now I need to cut back and see which of these connections were actually important. Um, and this is um, following this sort of path is a way um, that um, one can actually improve your training in neural networks in part to prevent this overfitting from before. Okay, so what am I going to be talking about today? Um, I will give a very quick introduction to neural networks, which again, I don't have to go into as much detail because Felix did such a great job, but I wanna have the basics there in case someone missed, um, missed his talk. Um, and then a little bit about the singular value decomposition, which I think people are finally um, valuing as much as it should be. Um, I know I know for uh, in some classes uh, in linear algebra, sometimes people don't talk about the singular value decomposition or they mention it, but they don't really see the power. So I just um, want to proselytize and advertise my love for the singular value decomposition. 
And then I'm going to use that to, to motivate um, at least one of the networks that I will be presenting and trying to understand neural networks. Okay, at most basic uh, level, what is a neural network? So we have two types of components that are playing with each other. So first we have some sort of non-linear function that um, takes its input R um, and goes to R, and this is called an activation function. Um, sometimes there are these higher order things like softmax, but we'll just be fo focusing on this particular kind. And then a layer of a neural network is defined by a matrix and a vector. So what happens is we have the inputs from the previous layer, which we can represent here as a vector. Um, and then we multiply that vector by a matrix. And then we add to that um, product there a vector. So we have this affine linear map. So we take the input from the previous layer, we do an affine linear map, um, and then we apply this nonlinear thing. And typically we're going to do something where we take a nonlinear function from R to R and we just apply it component wise. So we get a vector in Rn and then we do something to it each component or in the last talk a vector in Cn and we do something to each component. Um, and then all a neural network is, is just the composition of these layers. So we just do affine linear map, activation function, affine linear map, activation function. And when we're training, so when, talks, when one talks about training a neural network, what one is learning are precisely what are the entries of these matrices and vectors. So in particular, we can view a neural network um, with L layers as a function that takes its inputs in knots and its outputs in L. And so here we have the size of each layer will be denoting by NJ. So this kind of gives us at least three, and there's many other different ways one can do this, but at least three different ways that we could mathematically analyze neural networks. So one is we could analyze the entire network as a function. So we just say, okay, we, we know a network has a certain um, inputs that are vectors in a certain dimensional space and outputs as a vector in a certain dimensional space. Um, and then we can just treat that as a function and analyze that using the tools that we have. So this is, again, something that we saw um, in the last talk. Um, another thing we can do is actually just analyze each independent layer. So not ignore the guts of what's going on inside these so-called hidden layers, but actually see mathematically what's happening with them. And the, the last sort of class of methods is to analyze properties of real data sets as they travel through the network. So neural networks are trained to do particular tasks on real data sets or to generate something that emulates real data sets. So it would make sense if we wanna understand them better to sort of view them in their element. Uh, and in this talk today, I will be introducing um, an example of a, a method from each of these different classes. And I will say as a mathematician, um, you know, you have some hope of proving things with these first two methods. You don't have any hope really of proving things about the third method, because if you could prove theorems about the class of funny cat videos on the internet, then you probably wouldn't need neural networks at all because we would already understand them mathematically and know what they're doing. Um, but what we can do as mathematicians is we can take our tool set that we know from other types of mathematical problems and then apply them heuristically to understand these data sets. And you can still get pretty interesting results, even though you, know, you can't write a, a thesis on it because you're not gonna have any proofs. Okay, um, so ReLU is a very, very common activation function. Um, and basically all it does is it looks at each component of a vector and it says, hey, is this component positive? Then I'm gonna keep it. Is it negative? Then I'm gonna make it zero, I'm gonna throw it away. Um, and there's a lot of different reasons that one would want to in applications sort of like in the implementation, use it. Um, I'm going to present something that's, that's really focusing on the mathematical properties of this function. So on one hand, it's really nice in that it's nearly linear. Um, in one sense, it's nearly linear in that it's piecewise linear, like in a spline sense. Um, it's also nearly linear where you're using linear in a more algebraic sense. So it's non-negatively homogeneous. So whatever um, input you put in, if you scale that input by a non-negative number, then you can pull that scaling out. Ob obviously that doesn't work with a, if you scale it by a negative number, but you can pull out positive numbers. 
and you don't have additivity, but you sort of have this sub subtractivity. So if you take the um, the norm of the ReLU of a vector minus ReLU of another vector, that's bounded above by the norm of the uh, difference of the original vectors. So we have these things that are floating around that are kind of kind of linear-ish. Um, here's how ReLU is very, very, very not linear. Uh, so let's just look at this sequence of three different sets. So we start off here on the far left, um, and it's just the set of points that are in the unit circle. Um, and then we multiply those points by some matrix, and what we get out is we get this tilted ellipse. And now we apply ReLU to each component. Now the centering of this is a little bit different. So here we have in this middle, you can imagine that sort of the middle point is the actual origin and we have these axes. And now this lower right corner, this lower right corner is where the origin is. So um, the scaling is a, is a lot, but what we're seeing here is these little bars here, those aren't plots of the axes. Those are actual sort of tendrils that come up from ReLU. So, this curve here is just this part, this curve, this upper left corner of the ellipse. It's the part of the ellipse was in, that was in quadrant one. So all the param, uh, all the comp both the components are positive, and so therefore they aren't changed. But anything that say in this lower right corner that gets squished up to its x coordinate, which leads to this tendril. And similarly here, for this upper left corner, that gets squished into a tendril because they're just being mapped to their y coordinate. They're projecting onto the um, my axis. And then here, everything in the lower left corner just goes the origin. So geometrically, there's some weird stuff happening when you start analyzing ReLU. OK, so here's my little detour on the singular value decomposition um, that I'm going to preach the, the, the goodness, the gospel of the singular value decomposition. But I'm also not going to, it is going to be set up important for one of the methods I'll present later. Um, so whenever we have any matrix, any matrix at all, um, we can factor it as a product of three matrices, U, S, V star, where U and V are unitary, um, and S is a diagonal matrix, so um, not necessarily square. So it has the same number of rows and columns as our original matrix A. And then we have along the diagonal these um, non- negative non-increasing values, and these are called the singular values. So um, this is very much like an eigenvalue decomposition. Well, it is an eigenvalue decomposition, or it comes from a, of both A, A star and A star A. But um, it's, it's great because you can apply it to any matrix. And so here's what an S would look like if we had um, more columns than rows than original A. Um, so we just have a bunch of zeros and then just this one little diagonal. Um, so one of the reasons why singular value decomposition is so useful in data science is this schmidt eckert young mirsky theorem, which I used to call the eckert young mirsky theorem, and then I just uh, discovered from someone's talk that there's something floating around even earlier. Um, so here's what it says. I'm going to take my matrix A and write it at this product U, S, V star. I'm going to make a new matrix where I keep the U and the V star the same. And I'm just going to slightly modify this diagonal matrix by zeroing out all of the singular values that aren't the first K elements. So it's possible for there's there to be zeros already here. So if A is like rank one, then this sigma one is the only non-zero thing. And these are already gonna be zero no matter what. Um, but if we do that and we multiply that together and we call this new matrix AK, then it's solution to um, multiple optimization problems, which is not usually the case. Usually something is good um, in one optimization problem, but not the other. So what are these, these problems? So this A sub K is going to be at a best approximation of our original matrix A under two different regimes. One is we look for all the matrices that have rank at most K, and we say which one of those best approximates A in the Frobenius norm. And we play the same game. We say amongst all matrices with rank at most K, which one of them best approximates A in the, the two spectral norm. And in both of those cases, it's going to be this matrix right here, where it might not be unique if there happens to be some repeated singular values, but 
but in general, this is going to be the solution to these two different things. So this is really, really powerful because this is just saying this is somehow canonically like the best rank K approximation of A. Uh, and one of the most useful ways to, to use that in data science is with principal component analysis. So the basic idea is if we have these points here and we assume they align in some possibly affine subspace, then what we can do is we can take our data points and we center them so that the just the component wise average is the origin. Stack up the vectors, these centered vectors in a matrix, perform the singular value decomposition. And any large singular values correspond to the directions of the data trends. So what we have here is this long black arrow. This is the first singular value that course the length of it corresponds to the first singular value from when I stacked up all of these data points into a matrix and did singular value decomposition. And then this little, the length of this little black arrow is corresponding to the second singular value. And the directions of these are just, well, I put my data as columns, some people do as rows, but for me, these are just the columns of that U matrix. And so what this is saying is, hey, this thing with a big singular value, that's actually an important trend in the data. Um, and this really boils down again to this really nice result from linear algebra. Um, and also a lot of times people use linear regression when they should not be using linear regression because linear regression, you're making an assumption about the dependence between the points. And so principal component analysis is really the thing that should be used. Okay, so um, done with that little detour. And now I'm going to say what we need to know about the singular value decomposition to um, generalize it to be a way of analyzing neural networks. So we're going to write this definition of a singular value and something that looks really disgusting, but it will help us in, in the generalization. Um, so we're gonna start this um, script B and that we're gonna find that to be the unit ball. And so if we have a matrix A, then the kth singular value of that matrix is actually equal to the spectral norm of uh, this product that we take of U, so this is the U from the SVD, times this diagonal matrix that starts with K minus one zeros and then has as a tail the remaining singular values and then V star, so because U and V star are both unitary. So this sort of leading diagonal element is gonna be what pops out as the, the, the two norm of this. And then, um, well, this is just equal to A minus A K minus one. So we're just taking our A and we're subtracting off the thing that has this first K minus one. Um, and just by the definition of this matrix norm, we can rewrite this as the maximum of just the vector norm, uh, the two norm over all vectors in the unit ball of A evaluated at X minus A minus one evaluated at X. And now we're gonna do the really gross thing and say, well, we know what this AK minus one satisfies because of the um, schmidt eckhart mirsky young theorem. And so we're gonna choose turn this into a min-max problem where we are maximizing over X in the unit ball and minimizing over all matrices B that have rank bounded above by K minus one. So keep this in the back of your mind. We will see it again in a moment. Okay, so as I mentioned, we're, we'll have sort of three different approaches to try to understand neural networks. Um, and remind you again that adolescents have fewer synapses than one-year-olds. Okay, so we're gonna take that min-max problem that we saw for singular values, and we're just gonna do, once you have this, this kind of complicated thing, the easiest thing one could do to say, okay, I wanna analyze a single layer of a network that has as its activation function, ReLU. All I'm going to do then is I'm gonna take this layer and I'm going to just throw in ReLU. So, define a new type of singular values that I'll call ReLU singular values. And I'll note this as S instead of a sigma, um, where we're taking the min max setup is the same, but now it's the norm of ReLU of AX minus ReLU of LX. So I'll say, this is the variant we have to prove things. Um, but those of you who work with a lot of neural networks might say, hey, where's the bias? So there's also a variant that has the bias and it's maximized over training data and not the, the unit um, ball. Um, and there's some numerical stuff, but there's nothing proven about that variant. 
Um, but the observation is these train ReLU layers seem to have implicitly lower rank than their weight matrix would seem to indicate. So you basically, you train a network, you look at a particular layer and you look at the rank of that weight matrix, that A that, that you're multiplying your vector by. Um, and that's a certain number. And then you, you kind of look at this approximation here and look at the decay of these singular values and say, hey, there's a matrix L that has much, much smaller rank than the rank of the matrix A, but actually approximate it really well. Once you throw ReLU into the mix, then ReLU of that L is very, of that low rank L is very similar to ReLU of the, the higher rank A that you actually have in your network. So you can actually use this for pruning. So taking a look at two of these different plots, these are um, two different data sets that were used. So the top is CIFAR 10. So it's a class of 10 images like dog, cat, boat. Um, and the bottom is MNIST, the very simple um, collection of handwritten digits. And um, what's done here is these, in both cases, networks were trained to classify the data. And, um, and then we um, pruned by saying, okay, these layers here based on this, this SK actually could be approximated by lower rank weight matrices. And so let's just start lower, forcibly lowering the rank of these weight matrices. Let's throw out these synapses from the one-year-old's um, brain um, and then look at what the accuracy is. So the black curve in both um, plots is what happens to the accuracy as we move from left to right and we push, squeeze down lower and lower the ranks and all of these weight matrices. And we can see we do a lot of different iterates before the accuracy starts dropping off from the originally trained network. Um, and we can also see some other cool things like um, these curves are the ranks of the uh, matrices based on the layer. And so in both cases, the first layer, you can squeeze out more of the rank first um, before you're able to start squeezing out the rank from other layers. Okay, um, so very quickly, because I'm running short on time and I wanna make sure that I get to the third method. So the first method we've gone through is an example of we treat each layer as its own function and we analyze properties of that as a function. This method here is of the class, let's push real data through a network and use some tool that we have from some other field of mathematics to understand it. Um, and the tool that I will be using here is Gaussian mean width. Um, so it's also known as Gaussian complexity and statistical learning theory. Um, and at least in my, in our community, I would say probably came, um, most people became aware of it in Vernon Rashinin's paper in 2015 um, about high dimensional geometry and you know, connections to compressed sensing. So here we have this complicated formula, but this is the idea. Uh, I have some set of data, K and Rn. Doesn't need to be a continuous blob. It can be completely a discrete set of data. And I'm going to spin up a vector with respect to some sort of probability distribution. And once I spin it up and I get a direction, I'm gonna move that vector around. I'm gonna slide it through without changing its orientation through the set and say, at what point is the set the widest in that direction? And then I'm going to take an expected value. And when the way that I spun up the vector was I chose the entries Gaussian IID, then that is called the Gaussian mean width. And it's one way to sort of measure the complexity or the dimensionality of data. So what are these two plots showing? Um, again, both of the pl each plot corresponds to networks that have been trained on different data sets. On the left, we have HTRU. HTRU2, which is about phasar data, and on the right, just again, the classical MNIST. In both plots, as we move from left to right, we are training a network further and further and further. So we're, we're trying to make the network get better at um, classifying our input data correctly. And each of the colors corresponds to the output of different layers. So what are we doing? We're taking data sets, and I'll say exactly how they're chosen in a moment. We're taking some data set and we're pushing it through the network. So we look at the Gaussian mean width of the data set 
we push it through layer one, look at the new Gaussian mean width, put, push it through layer two, look at the Gaussian mean width, push it through layer three, look at the Gaussian mean width. Um, and so the Gaussian mean width is in the, the Y component. And the red is the layer one, green's layer two, and blue is layer three. Um, so as we see, as we go through the layers, these numbers are getting bigger. The Gaussian mean width is getting bigger. Now let me tell you how I, we chose the data sets. What we did is we would we randomly selected data sets of equal size. One is of points that were being correctly classified by the network, and one is of points that were being incorrectly classified. So the correctly classified points here are the solid lines, and the incorrectly classified are the dashed lines. And so one way to interpret these plots is saying that, well, when the network can correctly classify, what it knows how to do then is it pushes the different classes away from each other and it spreads them out. And so when you do the classifier at the end, everything is kind of pushed away. But when you have incorrectly classified data, the network doesn't know how to push apart the classes properly. And so we can see here these dashed lines, we're getting to the layer before we do this classification. Um, the incorrectly classified data is still like much closer together. All the different classes are much closer together in this sense of Gaussian mean width. Okay, so in the remaining few minutes, I am going to um, talk about the third method that we can use to analyze neural networks, uh, which is treating the entire network as a function and then using tools we have to analyze it there. Um, so here is uh, Felix's talk in one slide, my, my summary of it. What is universal approximation theorem? We let epsilon be some positive number. Um, then given rho in some function class and f in some other function class, there exists a neural network with that particular activation function rho that approximates f um, with an epsilon with respect to whatever function class norm you care about. Um, so I have some results uh, here and then um, obviously go back, watch Felix's talk, and then he had a very, very long litany of, of results. So um, universal approximation theorems are really beautiful. Um, one issue is that when you're training a neural network, you often fix an architecture. And by an architecture, I say, I want this many layers in each of these layers. I want this many um, neurons or nodes, i.e. like what are the dimensions of all of these matrices and vectors that I'm trying to learn. Um, and so one of the things that, that one can do, and this is actually um, highly inspired by other work that Felix has done, is say, I'm going to fix an architecture. So I'm going to say, I've chosen an activation function. I say the first layer has this many um, nodes, the second has this many, a third, all the way up to the end. And then I have some sort of domain, um, input domain. And I'm going to say, what are all the functions that can be achieved by that architecture? Um, and then, then use results from approximation theorem. So these first two results are from um, Felix and Philip and Mona's uh, paper, actually conference paper and journal article from uh, last year. So one is that um, if you take continuous functions, then this set is not closed in the set of continuous functions under the suit norm for almost all activation functions but ReLU. It's not closed in LP for arbitrary P. And then our new result is that it's not closed in various Sobolev spaces where the order K here is dependent on rho. P is arbitrary, but K is dependent on rho. Um, and I say dependent on rho, we have three different classes of, um, of results um, where the K has different dependencies. Okay, so this might sound bad because as a mathematician, you hear non-closed and that sounds bad, but this is actually really good. This speaks to the expressivity of neural networks. What it says to be not closed is it says, hey, I can construct neural networks that arbitrarily well in some, with respect to some norm, whatever norm is appropriate for this result, approximate some function that can't be exactly represented as a neural network. So non-closedness for neural networks is, is a good thing because it's saying that it can approximate, these neural networks can approximate things that we couldn't get just by writing out a neural network. So it means that there, there are more functions that they're able to approximate. 
Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip this sketch um, of one of the cases of that non-closeness result. Um, but the basic idea is you sort of just construct a sequence of neural networks that converges to something that you know isn't in the space. Um, so we have, a, a there's another result, which again, these the results concerning um, continuous function and LP spaces are from um, these one and a half papers uh, here. And then the Soblov spaces is from um, the work from my co-authors and I uh, that says, okay, let's change the problem slightly. We're gonna still fix the architecture. So we say, this is the activation function. This is the number of layers. This is the number of nodes in each layer. Um, but then we're additionally gonna say, okay, but for all the possible matrices and all the possible vectors we can fill in to make one of those neural networks, we don't want the, uh, the entries to get too big. So any component of those matrices. So we kind of take like a soup norm of the matrices and a soup norm of the, the vectors um, and we bound this by some number K. And now this is a new space of functions. And then we can ask questions about that. So it ends up that in that case, all of these spaces are closed um, with the same setups as before. So what this tells us is that when you approximate a non-realizable function, so when, you when you're approximating functions that are in the closure but can't be expressed as a neural network exactly, um, then this involves exploding weights. Okay, so now we're back to a sad thing because that sounds really bad because I don't wanna build a neural network with exploding weights. So now I'm gonna take you back on the yo-yo uh, with this last slide here. Um, so well, can we, if, if we wanna, I say that being non-closed means there's, there's power to this expressivity, uh, but then I say, but then if you wanna approximate these, these functions, then we start getting exploding weights. So can we realistically, e.g. with standard Python packages, so on and so forth, train a network to approximate non-realizable functions? Um, and first of all, heuristically, um, I mean, we know that neural networks work well, but also just specifically testing um, functions that we know are not, um, we, that we know can't be expressed, and then we try to train it, we're still getting networks that approximated the functions very well. And so we have this, this little result here, which for the sake of the time, I won't go into too much, but the basic idea is, yes, the weights have to explode as you go off, but the rate that they are increasing is slow relative to the weight, the rate that the um, error is decreasing. So we look at that approximation error and that is going down and we look at the um, um, weights and they're going up, but they're not going up so fast that we don't get a good, appro good enough approximation for most purposes along the way. Um, so just kind of moving forward, can we use some of these methods to help characterize networks with less linear activation functions, um, like the generalized singular values in particular that there's a lot of work with the positive homogeneity that I didn't mention that um, and the proofs that came out. So can, can similar things be used with less linear activation functions? Um, can the Gaussian mean with their general singular values be leveraged to improve networks and make them more robust? Um, and can we say more about the closures of these neural network spaces? Uh, so I wanna thank you for the invitation um, for papers and software that these two papers are the main two ones that I talked about here. You can go to my website. And also I wanna end with a shameless plug. Um, since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, a couple other co-organizers and I have been running the seminar called the Codex Seminar. It's a pan-university remote seminar on the theory and applications of harmonic analysis, combinatorics, and algebra. Um, in a couple of weeks, we actually have XY Han, who's going to come speak on neural collapse, which involves training neural networks until the last layer ends up becoming a simplex equangular type frame. So lots of things, buzzwords maybe, that appeal to people in the audience. Um, but please check that out if you are interested. And thanks again.